Welcome back. Uh, we are continuing the Establishment and Coordination Committee special report. Uh, the Lord Mayor has spoken. And are there any further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you, Chair. We just rise to, well, I rise to speak on the alteration of membership of Council's standing committees uh, and um, uh, appreciate the, um, uh, the administration's accommodation of our proposed changes. Um, there were some, as is laid out in there, um, from our side with Councillor Cumming um, standing down uh, as the Leader of the Opposition and uh, Councillor Cook and I uh, taking on new roles and that will uh, re that has required us to um, change uh, how we're operating on our side a little bit, so we certainly appreciate that. Uh, and I just want to take this opportunity uh, to, uh, to wish uh, Amanda Cooper all the very best. Uh, we were neighbouring neighbouring councillors uh, uh, when she was the councillor for the Brackenridge Ward, uh, and I know she um, was certainly around for a long time there, having replaced Carol Cashman. She was Campbell Newman's uh, special advisor on planning, uh, and he ensured that uh, she was pre-selected into Brackenridge, so she, he could be she could be his uh, hand-picked uh, planning chair. So uh, her legacy in this place will be the disastrous City Plan 2014. <coughs> So I certainly wish her all the best uh, in her future endeavours uh, in running uh, in uh, the seat of Aspley, and I certainly look forward to welcoming uh, Kath Palmer as the new councillor for the Brackenridge Ward following uh, March 28. And Kath's a fantastic local candidate, someone who uh, has worked in and uh, served in her community there in the Brackenridge Ward for many, many years, has raised her five children there, uh, and uh, they've attended local schools and been involved in that local community for a very long time. And she had a very respectable 10 per cent swing at the 2016 council election uh, to her. Uh, so we look forward to supporting Kath in becoming the new councillor for the Brackenridge Ward following the, uh, the March election. And also note that um, Councillor McLaughlin is uh, coming back to Civic Cabinet, of course, and this is Mr Zipline. Councillor McLaughlin is Mr Zipline. He was in charge of the most uh, uh, seriously bungled environmental project this council uh, has ever seen, and now he's going to be in charge of the most bungled road project that this council has ever seen. And the Lord Mayor, that seems very appropriate. Yeah, uh, the Lord Mayor did mention that uh, he'll have a vested interest in making sure that the disaster of Kingston Smith Drive, which will be a couple of years late, we know probably about a hundred million dollars over budget. Uh, and he's going to be in charge of that within his local community. So the pressure will certainly be on Councillor McLaughlin. <clears throat> and all those small businesses that are closing down, Councillor Cumming, that's, that's true uh, down there on Racecourse Road uh, as a result of uh, this disastrous project uh, of which, um, uh, which should never have been, never have yeah, been pursued yeah. given uh, we're spending six, well, in excess of, we're sure, in excess of $650 million More. to save to save how many seconds is that, Councillor Griffiths? Oh, so like... About 60. Yeah. About 60 seconds. So welcome back, Councillor McLaughlin. Uh, Mr Zipline will now be known as Mr KST. Former, uh, for further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak uh, briefly on the special uh, report before us today. Uh, can I start by saying um, I mean, what a six months it's been under this Lord Mayor's leadership, and I know he's not here with us this evening, obviously got more important things to be doing, uh, than uh, engaging in the debate of our council. But um, what I also note is the Bachelorette is on. Well, Councillor Maddox here, so maybe it's not... Is it, is it tonight? A Love Island. Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, please direct your comments through the chair. Oh, sorry, I did get distracted. So it's bad Labor councillors distracting me. Um, however, what I do want to say is one, um, it was rumoured that Councillor Cooper was running for the seat of Aspley, and I note that it's not been announced yet. Um, but presumably, at the first opportunity for something better, uh, she's uh, ditched her role here at council, um, and she's off. She's off to run for uh, the state seat of Aspley. Um, that's if you read what's in the Korea Mail. And Councillor Griffith, I'll take that interjection. Um, she's one of half a dozen that have, that have suddenly gone, uh-oh, this is all a bit hard, and they've either left or they've changed seats for something better, like Councillor Murphy. Wasn't that a good one? Um, you know, yeah. And, and I, know, I know Councillor Murphy got promoted to Civic Cabinet, and then he got demoted. 
He's not been re-promoted, so I'd be, I'd be wondering what's going on over there. Generation, ah, we'll get to that in a moment. Point of order. Hang on. Um, Councillor Johnson is misleading the chamber. Um, Councillor Burke has never been demoted. No, no, it's okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, all right, everyone's in high spirits after dinner, so uh, can we just all calm down a little? Um, no, Councillor Hammond, she said Councillor Murphy. Perfect. Yeah. It's, it's um, and I did hear us. I did yeah. hear Councillor. Excuse me. I, um, I did hear Councillor Johnson identify Councillor Murphy, uh, and so uh, I just invite her to continue. Yeah, I did. And anyway, um, I do want to say uh, that another one of the LNP councillors, for their own political benefit, has jumped ship after causing absolute havoc and destruction across this city. And I can't agree with Councillor Cassidy more, having been here through the rampage of destruction in our suburbs that Councillor Cooper has overseen as the planning chairperson of Brisbane in her time. Um, she is by far and away the person who has had the most destructive influence upon our city's policies and people's backyards of every single LNP councillor here. Now I can say that having gone through the Sherwood Graceville Neighbourhood Plan, the Dutton Park Fairfield Neighbourhood Plan um, and City Plan with Councillor Cooper at the helm. And Councillor uh, Simmons did take over for a little bit of the end of the Fairfield Plan. But let me say this. Here's my recollection of Councillor Cooper. Um, when the Sherwood Graceful Neighbourhood Plan, which the draft plan was released the month after I was elected to council, so I'd not been part of any of the discussions previous uh, to which were in Jane Prentice's term, I inherited a terrible document. I asked to speak with Councillor Cooper about it and I was given a meeting at 8 o'clock in the morning and Councillor Adams was present at this meeting. Uh, it might have been 8.30 because we had a nine o'clock party room meeting. And I was told at that meeting, I expressed verbally my concerns to Councillor Cooper about what was happening with the neighbourhood plan. And you know what she told me? Make a submission. Now that was when I was with the LNP. So I did make a submission, a lengthy and detailed submission, which is still publicly available on my website. It was highly critical of the neighbourhood plan. Um, the neighbourhood plan has caused chaos and destruction in the suburbs of Sherwood and Corinda, and I can tell you there is not a resident who does not know who is responsible for the five-storey uh, debacle um, that has happened in my ward, um, and that is this LNP administration led by Councillor Cooper. Now, there's a few other special things that Councillor Cooper did, um, which I'll come to perhaps at another time, um, but I just want to say, um, She's not a loss to this place. Um, her contribution has been one of division, lack of consultation, lack of returning phone calls, lack of basic courtesy, um, and certainly as planning chairperson, um, she has overseen, in my view, um, the thing that has caused more damage to this party um, than anything else in the history of the 12 years that I've been here. And I note that the only person who had maybe less than 30 seconds of praise was the Lord Mayor, and I'm not hearing anything else from anybody else, so presumably they're also uh, concerned. Oh, I'll take the interjection from the Deputy Mayor. That's not what the motion's about. Let me be clear, Councillor Adams. Councillor Cooper Councillor Johnston, yes. Councillor Johnston, I, just, I did ask you earlier, yep. please, please direct all comments yep. to the Chair. Yes, Mr Chairman through you to Councillor Adams, maybe she missed it, but Councillor Cooper has jumped ship. She's pulled up stumps yesterday. She said, no, nah, I'm not even bothering coming back here to you know, say goodbye or do whatever. I'm leaving, I'm leaving you with this huge big mess. And Councillor Adams doesn't think that's relevant to the Point debate order, before us Mr. today. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you. Will Councillor Johnson take a question? Councillor Johnson, will you take a question? No. No, <laughs> Councillor Johnson declined. That's very entertaining. <laughs> yeah, one day if I get question time, maybe, but guess what? I get to ask the questions. So I don't think that uh, Councillor Cooper is any great loss uh, to this council. And the really interesting thing is, um, when it comes to political self-interest, um, she's decided that uh, her margin of whatever it is, 14 or 15 per cent, is not enough. Um, but the but the state margin of one percent. Uh, Point of order, Mr. Is. Chairman. 
Point of order. Point of order to you. What has this got to do with the with what we're talking? Could you please bring the councillor back to the item at hand? I think I think uh, councillor Johnston. Um, so we've been going for about five and a half minutes. You have spent a lot of time. You, yeah, um, yeah, you've still got another four four minutes twenty seconds to go. You've you've uh, maybe maybe you with the time remaining. With the time remaining, can I encourage you to return to the substance Let of the me, resolution? I, I, I appreciate that Councillor Howard's confused, so I get the chance to say it again. Let me make it as clear as Point of again. order, Mr Point Chair. Order, Deputy Will Councillor Johnson take a question while Councillor Cummings jumps ship? Uh, Councillor uh, Johnson, will you take a question? Out of order, All right, OK, OK. Everybody? Like, clearly, people had a good time at dinner, all right? So just everyone just calm down. Just calm down. No, no, please focus on the matter at hand. So, Councillor Johnston, can I just ask you, please, um, please focus on the um, the report in front of us. Thank you. And that report says that Councillor Cooper has resigned. Yes. Councillor Cooper has jumped ship. And Councillor Howard is a bit like Councillor Adams. She seems unaware that the reason that there's changes again. Uh, on their side of the chamber is Councillor Cooper's found something better. She thinks the 1% Labor seat occupied uh, by the Councillor for McDowell previously is a better bet for her personal political future than running to represent the residents in her own ward. She thinks, she thinks the seat of Councillor Davis's, uh, who represented that area in state government, is a better option. Now, I don't know, uh, the discussions must have been really interesting behind the scenes, but maybe she just hasn't been bothered turning up, I don't know. She just couldn't be bothered to come along. And the day before she announces, uh, you know, she's not coming back to council. So um, there you go, everybody. And I just, I just want to say thanks for the um, wonderful effusive praise for your colleague of X number of years, at least 12, most of you. And uh, one person has had about 30 seconds to say. Yes. Um, so I look forward to the further uh, uh, debate about that. But um, what I would say is I don't have any praise for Councillor Cooper. The destruction in the area of planning as the planning chairperson for this city, the legacy issues that she has created, along with the deputy mayor, she was there as the deputy of planning the whole way through this, has been appalling. Now, um, I know the other thing I did want to briefly say is Despite the Lord Mayor standing up and saying he was all about renewal, he was all about the future, he was all about promoting young people and the young talent on his bench, yes. what's he done? What's he done? He's gone back to the future. Council McLaughlin, who stepped down as chairperson uh, to allow new talent within the party to come forward, that's what the Lord Mayor told us just six months ago. Suddenly, none of these other newer councillors here, including um, Councillor Davis, who's got a lot of experience. But yeah, I wouldn't worry, Councillor King, uh, Hammond. Um, none of these other councillors who've got experience, uh, who've been here, who deserve to have a bit of a go, none of them are getting a Guernsey. What are we doing? We're going backwards. We're going back to Councillor McLaughlin. And I look forward, Councillor McLaughlin, I'm sure you thought your happy days were upon you when you did not have me in one of your committees, but I'm going to ask you every single question that I can in infrastructure. Um, and I just think that at the first time this new Lord Mayor has been tested, instead of appointing someone with uh, fresh ideas, uh, with new ideas, uh, with different experience, what's he done? Gone back to where he was before. Not to Angela, not to Councillor uh, Owen, um, not to Councillor Wines, uh, not to Councillor Davis or Councillor Wong or Councillor Marks. None of these people who've been here for many years now, um, who would have had new ideas, new vision, none of them are getting a go. We're going back to Councillor McLaughlin. So I just say, Councillor McLaughlin, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful experience uh, having you as a committee chairman again. Uh, I hope that uh, it doesn't go as badly as it did as uh, environment chairperson. Um, the zip line clearly uh, was a disastrous decision um, that you oversaw the implementation of, and I certainly hope your track record will be better in infrastructure than it was in parks and environment. Further speakers, Deputy Mayor. 
Um, I would just like to stand and support the item before us, as Councillor Cassidy did, where this started with the changes from Councillor Cumming also deserting the ship. No one believes here that Councillor Cumming actually resigned. But you know what? The vitriol we just heard from the Councillor for Tennyson is the absolute reflection of the nastiness that comes out of that woman week after week. Now, it was appalling. I support the recommendations and recommend them to the chamber. Right, further speakers? Uh, Councillor uh, Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the motion before us. Um, I might start by briefly congratulating the new Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the new Leader of the Opposition for their um, promotions. Um, I also just wanted to thank Amanda Cooper, I guess Ms Cooper, for her time in Council. Um, I disagreed with her on quite a lot of issues, um, but I wish her well in the next um, stage of life. I, yeah, I won't go on about her legacy, but I, I do share some of the concerns about her um, legacy in terms of city planning and transport planning. Um, I did want to, though, in particular welcome Councillor McLaughlin to the um, new portfolio and, and share with the new chair some of my priorities and some of the issues which I hope through you, Mr Chair, he'll take notice of. I look forward to a really constructive working relationship with you, Councillor McLaughlin, and I hope we can achieve good things for the city. Um, one thing that I'd particularly like to place on your radar is the fact that Council's traffic engineers have quite a lot of discretion when it comes to making decisions about small things like parking, street parking, and, and big things like how major intersections should be redesigned. And those individual tra traffic engineers and transport planners are often make, giving advice to the chair, to the, um, to the elected councillors, based on certain values and, and preconceptions which are influenced by their training. We know that for decades, traffic engineers and transport planners have been trained to prioritise car flow and to look for opportunities to maximise traffic flow and that this often comes at the expense of pedestrian and cyclist safety and convenience. So I hope, Councillor McLaughlin, that when you're making your decisions as chair, that you're mindful of the fact that while the traffic engineers are experts in, in terms of engineering, they are also making subjective decisions based on certain values and preconceptions. And what I've found in my time as a councillor is that some transport planners and traffic engineers are very pro-active transport and some are essentially very pro-car. And this divergence can cause issues in council because two engineers can arrive at very different conclusions about the same question or the same intersection or the same local issue. Um, and what I've found quite frustrating is that often council's traffic engineers are quite old school in their thinking. They've been trained decades ago before um, the importance of supporting active transport really became common across the city and will sometimes tend to make decisions that prioritise traffic flow at the expense of pedestrian safety and convenience in particular. So I hope, Councillor McLaughlin, that when I provide advice about what's important to my residents and what I think the area needs, that you'll accept that although I'm, I don't have an engineering degree, I do understand the importance of active transport, and I do think that sometimes residents have it right when they say, oh, we need a pedestrian crossing here, or oh, we need a build out there, even if the traffic engineers are concerned that that might slow down cars. Um, this bit brings me to a, another important issue, which I'm sure you'll be getting correspondence from myself and from residents in the future, which is about hospital safety zones. The Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices gives council the power to trial 40 kilometre zones around hospitals. I understand this is something the previous chair, Ms Cooper, was considering um, and hadn't quite gotten around to having time to make a decision about but it's particularly important to me that around the Children's Hospital and Marder Hospital precinct in South Brisbane, we expedite the introduction of 40 kilometre, a 40 kilometre zone to prioritise the safety of people who are accessing that hospital precinct and particularly pedestrians and also bikes who are moving through that area. That um, stretch has changed significantly since the introduction of the Woolloongabba bikeway. It's already become much friendlier for active and public transport, but it's still not safe enough given the fact that there are lots of people visiting that precinct who may not know the road network and may not know the area as well. 
So, uh, so I'm urging you to seriously consider and ask your officers for a briefing about the possibility of introducing a 40 kilometre hospital zone around the Children's Hospital and Marta Hospital precinct. It won't make a significant difference on to travel times because motorists are held up at the traffic lights and intersections anyway. But what it will do is significantly improve safety and comfort for hospital patients and, and their friends and family who are visiting their, them there. So I'll, I'll raise that one with you down the track again. Another issue that I wanted to place on your radar as you're coming into this important role as Chair of Infrastructure is around the Lytton Road Widen project. The fact that um, on, a on a regular basis, Council makes changes uh, as part of the, uh, the construction work, and, and that means the road might get temporarily closed off or a new one might get opened. And for example, what we've seen recently is that there have been temporary changes to Heidelberg Street and Northcote Street, closing off access for vehicles on those streets. And as a result, Burlington Street is seeing significantly more rat running and higher volumes of traffic. I've raised this with the council officers, but I wanted to draw your attention to it as well, that the council officers managing the project and the private contractors need to take a more flexible and responsive approach to traffic management, where they understand that if they make a change along one stretch of the corridor, that has flow on impacts to how other roads are affected. So when they make those changes to temporarily close off side streets, they need to be introducing temporary traffic calming and, and temporary lower speed limits to discourage and offset the negative impacts of rat running. Finally, I wanted to draw your attention to the intersection redesign of River Terrace and Main Street in Kangaroo Point. I'm receiving a detailed briefing about this project tomorrow, but I strongly object to the core principles of this project, and I will be um, advising residents that they should organise protests and occupations to resist it. This, protest, th this project um, is going to significantly increase the traffic volumes along River Terrace in, in Kangaroo Point, which is a, a key access point to that very well-loved and beautiful clifftop park. Now, it would be same. It would, it would be a great shame if people couldn't get to that park because they have to cross a highway, and that's what River Terrace is emerging into. This intersection upgrade, which will encourage more traffic to flow down River Terrace as opposed to using Main Street, is going to negatively impact everyone who's trying to access that park and is going to have a negative impact on um, primary school students of St Joseph's who are trying to walk to school to St Joseph's Primary School in Kangaroo Point. So I urge you to take a close look at, at that project to, for, to redesign the intersection of River Terrace and, and Main Street and to understand and have fair warning that I'm going to fight that one tooth and nail because I think it's a terrible waste of money. I don't think it improves um, active transport through that area. The fact that it doesn't even seem to include dedicated bike lanes is deeply concerning for an inner city area that has such high volumes of pedestrians and cyclists. So, I, as I said, I, I look forward to working with you, Councillor McLaughlin. I hope um, that we can find some common ground, even if we disagree on some issues. And I hope you'll res respect the fact that I do do my best to consult with residents and that when I provide advice to you about what the community wants, it's on the basis of detailed consultation and surveys. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I'm, I'll be brief. Uh, I think it's a shame Councillor Cooper's not here to have a departing speech. I think yeah. it's important that people who've spent uh, some time in the chamber uh, have a departing speech, and, and I think that my, uh, my philosophy in, in talking about people who are leaving, and unless you've got some intense dislike of them, I think you should, it's like you know, talking about the dead, you should say nice things about them. <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I, don't, I mean that seriously, sorry. Uh, the, uh, we heard a rumour that Councillor Schrinner, the Lord Mayor, was very upset that Councillor Cooper hadn't told him that he was, she was uh, con trying to leave, and he insisted that she get, get out as soon as possible, and uh, that may be the reason why she felt uh, obliged to, uh, to resign last night, and I hope that's not the case. But my, look, my greatest recollection of Councillor Cooper was when she first came to, uh, to Council, she was working in the Lord Mayor's office. I think she was the endorsed candidate, so it was pretty convenient to be working in the Lord Mayor's office as well, and she was uh, Campbell Newman's spokesman on, uh, uh, on uh, planning matters, and uh, the thing that annoyed me the most was the treatment that she got as she used to come along to committee meetings and she'd be invited up to uh, sit, at the, sit around the table and uh, treated as an elected councillor at committee meetings of the planning 
And that was all because of Councillor Hinchliffe. So I'm saying it's Councillor Hinchliffe's fault that she was treated so generously. But anyhow, uh, that was a very interesting. And of course, then uh, the election after that, we went to the election and Campbell Newman said that Labor weren't cooperating in any way, shape or form. You know, we're, we're delaying him doing anything at, at every opportunity, which is totally, totally false. But unfortunately, the electorate uh, believed it and uh, uh, the uh, LNP got a big swing towards them. But uh, the... Uh, the treatment of the very generous treatment of Councillor Coop by Councillor Hinchcliffe used to make me a little bit sick by the end of each meeting every week from planning. But anyhow, but uh, but anyhow, uh, I I've, uh, haven't had a lot to do with Councillor Cooper over the years. I didn't think the city plan was a was a great document. But at the end of the day, she uh, when I did raise matters with her, she uh, did uh, did look into them and give me a reasonable response. And for that, I thank her and I wish her all the best with her future. Right. Uh, further speakers. Lord Mayor. All right. I now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, the environment, parks and sustainability decisions, please. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report setting out the decisions of the Establishment and Coordination Committee as Delegate of Council during the Spring Recess 2019 on matters usually considered by the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee be noted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, to the report setting out the decisions of the Establishment and Coordination Committee as a delegate of Council during the spring recess of 2019 on matters usually considered by the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee be noted. Is there any debate? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I wish there was a question on notice I took today about what um, in the, our committee of what consultation the hard-working local councillor, Councillor Owen for Callanvale Ward, did on some dog off-leash areas in her, in her ward. Um, so first of all, the, the Callanvale um, dog off-leash area, there was actually a master plan um, put together for that precinct. Um, and Councillor Owen, as she always does, is very, um, very, very community with her local residents. Um, there was flyers put out and also um, with residents and school children, um, she did some workshops um, to, to work through this master plan. So the Greenaway Esplanade, um, again the hard working councillor for Callanvale Ward, it was also master planned. She sent out consultative letters to residents and invited them to a barbecue um, to actually speak about the design. Um, and the request for um, their views, which were taken on board, and a lot of the, their, their views was actually taken into consideration and implemented as part of the plan. So I'd like to thank the councillor for Callanvale for a very extensive community consultation that she did for the dog off leash areas and the dog lovers of Brisbane. Mr. Chair, I wish to note something this afternoon, um, this evening, that I heard, and I'm extremely disappointed in. I'm not going to name the councillor who did this, um, but I will say it's not Councillor Toomey who's on the other side of the chamber. It was brought to my attention that um, a councillor in this place whose office declined a meeting um, with council officers then made an attempt to say that he was excluded from consultation. Um, there was no communication from the councillor, said councillor's office. Um, to try and establish a different meeting. I understand a meeting um, was cancelled and then rearranged, but it was declined from that councillor's office. What disturbs me even more is that side of the chamber and that particular councillor took it in their stead to abuse one of our council officers point of order. this afternoon. Uh, point of order to you, Councillor Cumming. Uh, the uh, chair is making remarks which are, uh, you know, very offensive uh, to uh, all the male councillors. I think she said she called it him, so I, was, I presume it's a male councillor on this side of the chamber. I think she should specify who she's talking about, and not smear all of us with, with the, uh, with not not naming whoever it was that has caused the problem in her view. Um, as for, I will not um, be naming this particular councillor. This yeah. particular councillor knows who I'm talking about um, and has sworn at a council officer. Um, when now, the now, council um, officer. Um, councillor Hammond, um, it is a little vague. Um, can I just ask you to sort of um, 
Uh, I'm going to allow you to continue very briefly, but can you please summarise the, the thought you're on quickly and then move on? The council point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, I, Councillor Owen. I believe on the meetings local law, the chairmen are allowed to speak on any aspect of their portfolio for whatever time they require. Yeah. Look. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Owen. I, I appreciate that that's true, um, but um, can I just? Um, all right. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay. Point of order. Point of order. Um, I'll yep. do them in order. Councillor Johnson first yep. and Councillor Griffiths. I believe it would be a breach of the meeting's local law under an adverse reflection um, on oh, those councillors. Oh, okay, everybody. On those councillors. All right. On those councillors about whom these remarks have not been made. Okay, all right, everybody. Um, okay, can, okay, everyone, please just take a moment. Everybody, take a moment. Um, um, I have asked Councillor Hammond to, to um, end the line that she's going on as quickly as practicable so that we can move on to the substance of the matter in front of us um, and be mindful of, uh, be mindful of that there is no privilege in this place but also um, that, that I always encourage people to be uh, fair in the statements they make. Councillor Griffiths, your point of order. Uh, I was just going to say, we are often remind about imputing motive. Well, this is imputing motive on all the male councillors on this side of the chamber, which I think is unacceptable. Um, as I say, I've asked Councillor Hammond to, to uh, uh, conclude her remarks on this topic um, succinctly and then um, move on to the substance, please. Councillor Hammond. I would like to remind all councillors in this place on both sides of the chamber that swearing at council officers, hard-working council officers, is not acceptable. Um, it's not acceptable to the code of contact of council and saying you will withdraw that statement is not acceptable. Withdrawing statements are made for this place and this chamber. Um, if you have done those actions, then an apology um, Point to of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. Mr Chair, if what is being said is true, the councillor should be identified and they should be appropriately re referred uh, to the CEO's office. Um, impugning um, motive yeah, on I, every I, I male councillor on this side of the chamber is um, completely so inappropriate. If she's worried about defamation, she shouldn't be say, if it's true. Um, I'm sorry if my comments have offended anybody. Um, I'm just um, look, making here's, it... Here's the thing. I mean, it's just very difficult in where I'm sitting to... Um, when no particular individual is identified, and that's that's what's making it difficult. Okay. Um, point of order, Mr. Point Chairman. Of order, Councillor Owen. The Chairman of Environment, Parks and Sustainability is making general comments now at this point in time, which should be treated as such after the Chairman has given direction and therefore should be entitled to make any comments relating okay. to general right. portfolio. That's it. Okay, everybody, everybody stop now. All right, Councillor Hammond, I think you've made your point. Please move on right now to your next topic. Thank you. If I offended anybody, I right apologise um, for that. So um, I'll leave the rest up to debate. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yep. Right, to the uh, matter before us today, which is the naming of the uh, uh, river walk at Yurong Pili uh, Green, uh, the state government's uh, development. Can I say, um, the first I knew about this uh, was when I saw the Lord Mayor on the news standing next to the developer, uh, naming the river walk after Ashley Cooper, uh, a former uh, great tennis player of Australia. I, for one, was quite shocked to see um, that a park had been named, um, and I had no idea about it uh, in my ward. Now, let's be clear. The motion before you today says that I was consulted. I was not sent the submission. I was not sent the recommendation. I was not consulted about this. In fact, the council officers sent me, in writing, paperwork saying that they did not support the naming of the Ashley Cooper River Walk. Uh, and the proposed other name that the developer wanted, which is Yurong Pili Green for the park. So they wanted to name a development after their, themselves uh, and name a park after themselves. 
and council officers told me it would not be going forward. Now, on the basis of that discussion, the council officers and I discussed what we would do. What we decided we would do is undertake a consultative process uh, for the naming of um, the parkland uh, and uh, the Riverwalk uh, proposal. Now, when we had a simple verbal discussion, we were on site at a cricket field where we'd met in Chelma to talk about a cricket field. They mentioned to me um, that uh, the Riverwalk proposal for Ashley Cooper was being considered, and I said, fine, send it all up to me, we'll do the consultation and we'll go from there. Next thing I do find out is that it's being announced by the Lord Mayor and now it's gone through this council without any consultation with me whatsoever. Consultation, as we discussed with the officers, is well underway uh, for the naming of the park. Three, I asked, as I do with all park namings, ask residents for their ideas if there's no suggestions. They suggested three names, uh, Ash Barty Park, uh, Talking Oak Park, as the suburb of Tennyson is named after all Alfred Tennyson, Lord Alfred Byron, Lord Byron Tennyson, or whatever, uh, all of the poets' uh, places. And three, Yurong Pan Park, after the Indigenous owners of the land. Uh, we've done a consultative process and we'll be providing that information through Council in the normal way. Now, this is the third time in the past year that Council officers have failed to consult me on uh, naming uh, or, and or petitions in my ward. Uh, the other being Stevens Lane in Yoronga and the other one being Ipswich Road speed reduction in Annerley. So let me be clear, the information stated in the council papers before us today is completely false. I was not sent the submission. I was not sent the recommendation. At no point was I asked, Councillor Johnston, do you support this name? Um, and that is appalling. I've written to the CEO. Um, he writes back to me that uh, apparently I had a discussion with the council officers, which I agree we did have a verbal discussion at a cricket field where we talked about cricket things and we discussed a course of action for consultation. Now, I went away and carried out that discussion in good faith and what happened? Um, this submission came forward without my knowledge, without my recommendation and without any consultation with me. Um, and it's very easy to check, and before Councillor Hammond decides to have a red-hot go, produce the piece of paper uh, showing that the matter was sent to me for consultation, produce the piece of paper where I replied or failed to reply, um, and show me that the council process for consultation was followed. It was not. It was not. And this is the third time in the past year or so that it has happened. I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think any councillor would think that um, naming should happen in namings and announcements should happen um, in their wards without them having any idea about it. And that is exactly what happened here. So let me be clear. This is what I said to the council officers at the time they verbally raised it with me at a meeting about a cricket field in Chelmer in passing as we're walking to my car. Oh, the tennis people want to name the river walk after Ashley Cooper. And I said, oh, I don't have a problem with that. Um, make sure you run it through the process. None of that happened. Next thing, the Lord Mayor's making an announcement. Now, Ashley Cooper is a distinguished tennis player. Um, but if this council continues to name parks without going through the consultative process, here's the other example, and this is about five or six years ago, Norm Rose Park. Um, also in my ward at Fairfield, an ex-Liberal councillor, a Liberal Party member from Yoronga, wrote to the Lord Mayor and asked him to call it Norm Rose Park. The Lord Mayor did it. I was rung on the Friday before it was coming to council. Councillor, this is happening. I wasn't consulted. I was told this is happening. Now, there is a track record of this administration doing what they want in Tennyson Ward and failing to respect the proper processes for consultation with the local councillor. And Councillor Hammond, let me be clear, if you think what I'm saying is wrong, produce the piece of paper showing me and showing every single person who's listening, watching and in this place that the recommendation was sent up to me for consultation and show me my reply. 
because I can tell you it did not happen. And the first I knew about it was when it was announced on the TV and uh, the Lord Mayor decided, stood there with a developer for God's sake, not me, not the local residents who've borne the impacts of the construction for years. He stood there with the developer, developer, um, and, and decided to do this. So that's how consultative our Lord Mayor is. Um, he'd rather be out with a developer, um, a state government developer, uh, talking about things than consulting with the local community and the local councillor. I think it's appalling. I've written today, and I, I'm definitely referring this matter off to the Ombudsman because it's not once, it's not twice, it's not actually three times, multiple occasions has this happened and it's not acceptable. It's just not acceptable. Um, and if the CEO will not do anything about it, then I will. I'm elected in this place, I have obligations and responsibilities and I will carry them out to the best of my ability. But when this council will not consult me in line with normal council policy, that is not acceptable and I will call it out every time. Now to Ashley Cooper I say, I'm sorry I've had to say all this. It's not pleasant, but let me be clear. I wish that this council had engaged in a consultative process so that people in our local community supported the naming of their local places. The Lord Mayor doesn't live there, I don't live there, but none of the local residents were consulted about this, not a single one of them, not one. And I just think it is appalling that that is the way that the LNP and these developers are treating residents. They'll do whatever they want, they'll go out amongst themselves, debate it, decide it, and announce it without any consultation with anyone, and that is wrong. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour of the resolution in front of us say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, as it's nearing nine o'clock, uh, excuse me, let me just Councillors, as the time is nearing 9pm, the meeting will automatically stand adjourned unless we agree to continue the sitting. Uh, it, is it the will of this council? Uh, is it the will of the council? The sitting of council proceed beyond 9pm. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, consideration of certify of excuse me, consideration of notified motions. Councillors, I draw it to your attention to the notice of motion and item nine of the agenda. Lord Mayor, would you please move the resolution? <clears throat> okay. Uh, as uh, has been put on the notice paper, um, I move that this council resolves to review the terms of reference for the independent councillor remuneration tribunal related to council contributed superannuation for councillors. And subject to that review, to convene the independent councillor remuneration tribunal to impose a special meeting of the tribunal within the ordinary five-year cycle of meetings as provided for in the councillor remuneration policy to review councillor superannuation benefits as introduced by the former Labor administration in 1995 and formalise a report within the current council sitting period. Also, uh, that council reaffirms its support for elected officials' remuneration being determined by an independent body. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Allen, uh, that this council uh, resolves to review the terms of reference for the independent council remuneration tribunal related to council contributed superannuation for councillors and subject to that review to convene the independent councillor remuneration tribunal to interpose a special meeting of the tribunal within the ordinary five-year cycle of meetings as provided for in the councillor remuneration policy to review councillor superannuation benefits as introduced by the former Labor administration in 1995 and finalise a report within the current council sitting period reaffirms its support for elected officials' remuneration being determined by an independent body. Is there any debate? The Lord Mayor. Obviously this is something that uh, was flagged last Thursday evening. Uh, and put on the notice paper so that all councillors had ample uh, opportunity to review and understand what was proposed. Uh, effectively, uh, we have a situation where uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, and it was in 1995, uh, councillors in this place, and it was a Labor administration at the time, uh, decided to 
uh, award councillors 20 per cent super. Now, um, that policy uh, was voted on at the time. And as I referred to before, there was only one councillor in this place that was there at the time, and that was Councillor Peter Cumming. He was actually here for the vote. Uh, so fast forward to today. Uh, I don't believe in the last 20 plus years that anyone's ever mentioned this is an issue. Uh, and certainly uh, Labor has never complained about this as an issue. Um, but obviously uh, Labor is desperate, out of ideas and have no vision. Um, so they see this as some kind of political opportunity uh, to make commentary on. Uh, so it, with that in mind, it continues to be our clear view that matters relating to salary or allowances, and in this case superannuation, should be rightly made by an independent tribunal. And that uh, takes it away from the decision, decision of councillors themselves and refers it to uh, the independent tribunal for consideration. So this motion effectively does that. It takes the matter of superannuation out of the hands of a vote of council here and places it uh, forward for recommendation by an independent tribunal. Uh, so hopefully this is something that all councillors will support. Uh, and obviously the outcome of that review will be determined and set by the independent tribunal. What we are proposing to do is to reactivate uh, the previous independent tribunal. Uh, and there have been some terms of reference circulated tonight uh, to all councillors that uh, we propose to uh, give to the tribunal. Uh, and given that uh, those terms of reference have been circulated, uh, I uh, would flag the following amendment to this motion. I move that we uh, insert the words and approve after the word review in uh, the uh, first uh, section of the motion. So that the, the motion, the amended motion, resolves to review and approve the terms of reference. Uh, and further, uh, on the fourth line down, once again, after the word review, to add approval uh, to convene the Independent Councillor Remuneration Tribunal. So effectively, what this amendment does uh, is to approve the uh, terms of reference that have been circulated tonight. Now, uh, I, I move Sorry. this and I ask for a Seconded. Seconded. I have a, an amendment proposed by the Lord Mayor and the Deputy Mayor. Um, but Lord Mayor, would you happen to have that in writing? Because I... There was a lot there. There's, there's a lot in this. Thank you. Um, so you're now moving uh, an amendment. So you have. So now you've moved an amendment. You have uh, uh, ten minutes to the amendment, please. And I just, I can see this being circulated. Please, can, please. Continue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, look, I won't need ten minutes. Um, uh, by adding the words "approve." We're uh, proposing that those terms of reference that were distributed tonight be approved. Um, and so this new motion or the amended motion that I proposed uh, will accept the um, proposed terms of reference. Now, to be clear, the changes to the terms of reference have been highlighted uh, uh, point in of order. yellow. Um, <clears throat> point of order to you, uh, yeah. Councillor Johnston. Look, I'm sorry about this, but I've been given a copy of a different motion. I haven't been given a copy of the amendment. Um, I'm not sure what you. I'm not, I don't know what I can't see. Obviously, I can't see what's in your hand, but I have in my hand a copy of what of what would be yeah. the motion but if it were amended. What's the amendment that we're asked to being debated? So it's I to. I haven't seen that. So it's the uh, words. What's actually being moved is my question. Yeah. So, so there's additions in what I so in. The line that begins resolves after the word review it says and approve is added and on the the line that begins councillors and subject to that review at that point you are inserting and approval at those points so it's just the addition of those four words 
So now it would be resolved to review and approve, and the same again on the line three down. So that's that's um, so that's what the uh, proposal is, and the uh, paper that you've been circulated is one that is the what would it be? What would the motion be if the amendment is accepted? Lord Mayor. Uh, so point of order, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for clarifying yes. that they're the changes. Can I just ask in future when we're being asked to debate? an amendment motion, that we get a copy of the amendment. That is what the standing orders do suggest. I understand that. I, um, In this instance, uh, I think that I don't have an objection to the, the manner which this has been brought, and we often, um, we often have a um, whole range of different ways that amendments come through, because people often do this without preparation. So um, at this point, I have no objection to, to this. It's in front of us. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Uh, so as I was saying, the, um, the proposed changes to the terms of reference take the previous terms of reference from the last review that was done, and I think it was done in 2017. Um, it takes those 2017 terms of reference and it updates them with the uh, sections in yellow. And those sections in yellow effectively do two things. Uh, actually, they do three things. Number one, uh, they reactivate the tribunal and call for the tribunal to meet as soon as possible uh, and have an extraordinary meeting. Number two, uh, those changes add superannuation into the mix for consideration by the tribunal. Uh, and number three, uh, the uh, terms of reference call for the tribunal to do a full review of salary allowances and superannuation. Uh, so to be clear, this is not just a review of superannuation. This is a full review of salary, allowances and superannuation. And so the independent tribunal is now, uh, if we approve this tonight, empowered to have a look at all of those factors and make a determination uh, and a recommendation back to us on those matters. Uh, so the amendments or the um, proposed changes uh, will achieve those things, uh, and I would certainly encourage all councillors to support this amendment. Uh, speakers to the amendment, Councillor Cassidy. No, just so speakers to the amendment, please. This amendment, this is we're having an, an amendment debate. Councillor Johnston, to the amendment. Yes, I'll speak briefly to the amendment, um, and I note um, that the administration is uh, going backwards um, with this; that they put something out in a hurry. They seem to be blaming the Labor Party, and to my knowledge, it's uh, the Sunday Mail and a journalist that prompted all of this. Um, so, you know, I think it's a bit interesting that the Lord Mayor is trying to blame somebody, uh, you know. Um, certainly, to my knowledge, I was rung by uh, a journalist and asked for comment on this matter, um, and I was happy to give it. And my position is the same as it's been since this issue first came up earlier in my term, which is I believe um, that our salaries uh, should be linked to um, those of, our, of council staff. I don't believe we should be on a separate system. If we um, are negotiating an outcome for them, um, then we should be uh, happy with whatever we're uh, doing with our staff. We have to pay people to be on a tribunal. Um, uh, we have to uh, you know, give them, delegate the decision away. Um, and I note that instead of directly fixing this problem, simply by asking, um, the, uh, asking the tribunal to review super, the Lord Mayor is now asking the tribunal to review salaries, allowances, super, and I don't know what else, um, but he wants to get, uh, you know, we're supposed to do this every five years, but instead of solving the actual problem here, he's wanting the whole system to be reviewed. Um, and in my view, that's, uh, that's a bit odd, and I'd be questioning why he wants to do that. Um, but the other thing that concerns me is the way in which the Lord Mayor has misled um, uh, people in this chamber and those listening today about how the system works. Again, he's blaming Labor for a system um, of super, 20% super. Now, I can only presume, I wasn't here when this happened, and I can only presume that it was probably even better than that prior to 1995. Um, and the decision 
uh, to establish 20% uh, super was taken by the Council of the Day in 1995. However, what I will say and what this administration cannot avoid is the decision to set up the Councillor Remuneration Tribunal um, six years ago was a decision taken under the LNP administration. The LNP administration, and that was Graham Quirk, uh, I think was Lord Mayor at that time, and uh, Adrian Schrinner, uh, the current Lord Mayor, is, was the Deputy Lord Mayor. They made the decision to exclude yes. superannuation from the review of the independent tribunal. Labor Party didn't decide to do that. The LNP administration that was there then and is here today, including the Deputy Mayor, made the decision to exclude superannuation from review. It wasn't Labor. Let me say it again. It was the LNP Point of order, administration. Point of order to Councillor Murphy. Um, can I just clarify? This is, this is debate on the um, amendment. Yes, the typographical amendment? It is. It well, is. can I just call relevance on that, Chair, because we're going to have a substantive debate very shortly. Yeah, um, I would. This I is probably, just I do, using I do the time. I agree with you, Councillor Murphy. Um, Councillor Johnston, the, the bulk of your presentation so far has been on the substance of the material um, resolution rather than the amendment. So can, if we can just, um, if I can just draw you back to the amendment before us, which is um, I request to add that the council now also approve the terms of reference, please. Thank you for making my point for me, Mr. Chairman. The amendment before us today is asking us to approve a course of action. Now, let me be clear. I want it on the record. My concern here is the Lord Mayor has indicated um, that this was Labor's problem, that Labor created this problem. They did not. When the uh, Independent Remuneration Tribunal was established by the LNP administration, they made the decision to exclude superannuation from the term of review. It wasn't the Labor Party. And I remember the debate, and I remember saying almost identical things to what I'm saying now. So I'll just put on the record again, for anybody who is listening at home, the attempt by this Lord Mayor to blame the Labor Party for something that he did, along with Graham Quirk, and the Liberals and all those councillors present at the time, he made the decision to exclude superannuation from the Independent Tribunal Review. Why that, why that was made, I don't know, and I don't recall it being debated particularly at the time. But I'm being asked to approve something now, um, and I think that it is problematic that the Lord Mayor is having to amend his own motion, and I'll flag, I have an amendment of my own that will be coming when we get to the further understanding. Further speakers to the amendment. Lord Mayor, to the amendment motion. All those in favour of the amendment say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. We now have a new substantive motion. Are there any speakers to the new substantive motion? Councillor Cassidy. Um, thank you, Chair. Just rise to uh, speak uh, in support of this motion, uh, this amended motion, uh, and in, in support of the new terms of reference for the Independent Councillor Remuneration Tribunal and for the reappointment um, of the uh, tribunal members. Um, it's quite amazing what a couple of weeks in politics will do um, to a Lord Mayor uh, like Adrian Schrinner, Mr Chair. This Lord Mayor is uh, running scared, Mr Chair. Uh, as Councillor Johnston, Johnston pointed out, uh, a question was put to the Lord Mayor and his team of entitled councillors uh, and to all councillors in this place about their views uh, on whether um, uh, we thought and they thought uh, that receiving 20 per cent superannuation uh, was acceptable and whether that met community expectations. Uh, and uh, true to form, uh, those on that side of the chamber, uh, Mr Chair, all had uh, no opinion about that whatsoever. Uh, they have grown uh, so bloated uh, in their comfort of office here. Uh, we know that they're uh, loving their expensive office. Uh, we know that they've been loving uh, that super payment for so long uh, that this Lord Mayor has been shamed into taking some action, uh, of which we called for first. 
Uh, so we're only, ha we're only too happy to support, uh, support this motion going forward. Uh, and I will put on record, I know the Lord Mayor and his team uh, won't uh, make any comment about that, uh, about the tribunal. We, of course, uh, think the tribunal should look at this uh, and note that um, the Lord Mayor and his LNP colleagues decided some years ago that they shouldn't be looking at this, although once it uh, um, makes the front page of the Courier-Mail here in Brisbane, apparently uh, all of a sudden he does want to he does want the tribunal to have a look at this. I'm happy to put on record uh, my uh, support uh, for um, what I think the community would expect uh, councillors to be receiving, and that's in line with uh, council employees. We're already paid very well in this place. I realise we all uh, work very hard. It's, un it's a unique opportunity we get to serve our communities in here. Um, we certainly don't do it for money. Um, uh, but I do think that the community uh, in this day and age has an expectation uh, that when you have an administration like this one that has been in power for 16 long years uh, and uh, you see creeping through more and more and more perks, more and more and more rorts, more and more and more waste, you see the community starting to have a problem with this administration whether it's the $100,000 cash walk-around money this Lord Mayor uh, pockets uh, each and every year, whether it's the $300 cab rides that Councillor Owen takes to uh, share concerts, uh, or whether it, to the Keith Urban concerts uh, as well, whether it's the um, Qantas Club memberships for, for private use that LNP chairs get when they, when they go on domestic or international flights, that the people of Brisbane don't get that opportunity to buy themselves Qantas Club memberships uh, with ratepayer money. Uh, and when it comes to things like um, uh, the 20 per cent super in this place. So I'm, I'm more than happy to say to the community out there, I don't think this is acceptable. Uh, and uh, when the Independent Remuneration Tribunal uh, takes a look at that, of, of which we are supporting here today, I certainly um, hope that they will take those community expectations into account. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, I rise to speak on the uh, amended motion um, before us today, and I flag um, that I'm more than happy to have um, the superannuation system um, reviewed. I remember when I started, um, my parents were a little bit concerned about it. They said, oh, you think this is the right thing to do financially? And I said, oh, well, it'll be a bit, bit tricky. but. Um, you know, at the time there was a very good superannuation um, program. However, it is out of step with community expectations and uh, certainly I'm happy uh, for a change to be made. However, um, since uh, the scrambling on the LNP side in relation to um, salaries, entitlements and allowances has occurred, an even greater, in my view, um, financial uh, problem has arisen. And I did not know this. Um, I certainly was aware that the Chairman, the Lord Mayor and others uh, received an expense of office. However, um, I thought, like all expenditure uh, by councillors, um, that it had to be accounted for. For every single cent that I spend as a councillor in my ward office, I must produce a receipt. And I'm happy to do that. It's a good system. I, I do it and I'm happy to account for it. And I have every single record for every single dollar that I've um, spent. And if I forget to get a receipt, then I don't claim reimbursement. That's the way it goes. Now, in addition to this, um, only a couple of weeks ago, Council introduced a second stage of accountability for the expenditure of ward funds, which is now um, for any expenditure over $100, we have to get a quote first um, and then uh, submit an invoice. So there's now a two-step um, process for the expenditure of funds, of ratepayers' funds, which again we'll comply with. I think it's going to create some problems like, for example, it's $120 to hire the church hall where I have my seniors afternoon teas and now I'm going to have to talk to the volunteers who manage the church finances and explain to them what a purchase order is, why they've got to put that into two versions uh, of a receipt or again, an invoice. Councillor Johnson, I understand. Like, Thank you. Like we all live, but I'm we making all my point here, world. Mr Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate that. My point is that we as councillors are asked to account for every single cent that we spend and that is absolutely the right thing to do. I was unaware that this same level of scrutiny was not being applied uh, to the expenditure of allowances. 
Um, it is shocking to me, um, as I heard, and then I asked Councillor Cassidy some questions, it is being paid weekly in cash into bank accounts. There is zero, uh, there is zero um, accountability uh, for uh, the expenditure of this funds, and I don't think that is right. And I note that the Lord Mayor has asked the tribunal now not just to review super, but to review allowances as well. So I believe that we need a further amendment to the motion to ensure that there is transparency and accountability in relation to this, and I move the following amendment. After paragraph one in the notified motion, add the following. In addition, the review and special meeting includes a system of public reporting and acquittal for any expense of office allowances for the Lord Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Committee Chairs, Chair of Council, uh, the Leader of the Opposition Thank you. and the Leader of the Opposition to strengthen public confidence in the expenditure of ratepayers' funds. Seconded. Okay. Uh, I have an amendment. Now, just to clarify, this is... This begins after the word period. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, would well, you um, you've got 10 minutes to the amendment. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I do not believe that ratepayers funds should be handed over essentially as cash, um, not when there's amounts between $20,000 and $100,000 uh, at, at stake. Um, it is completely unacceptable that there is no accounting regime for the expenditure of uh, these funds, and I believe there should be. Um, the motion before us today simply seeks to add um, the development of a uh, system for public reporting and acquittal to the processes of the tribunal. I note with great concern the last uh, report by the tribunal, which indicated that they are happy with the cash arrangement. Uh, to the Lord Mayor and other chairs. Um, that is staggering to me, um, that three people operating in an environment like we are about the accountability of public funds think that handing out cash, up to $100,000 in cash, is appropriate. So the quantum of these allowances is something for the tribunal to consider. Um, but certainly, in my view, there should be a clear accountability regime. Um, and in my view, um, a good starting point would be the state government's uh, system of accounting. They have a, a, an annual report which is tabled to show how the expenses are acquitted against the allowance. Um, there will be other good systems in place that this tribunal can look at, um, but it is absolutely unacceptable in today's age that $100,000 is handed over to the Lord Mayor as cash to spend on whatever he wants. Now, he may be spending it on buying cake at the local fete, he may be spending it on braces for his children, he may be spending it on um, new, new pot plants for his garden. He's at the moment under no obligation to say what he is spending the money on, and in fact he spent a week avoiding those questions very assiduously. Um, he is under no obligation to report how he expends this money. If he doesn't expend the money, uh, then uh, he just takes it as cash and it bumps up his salary. In my view, that is absolutely wrong. Um, a reasonable expense of office is probably not um, something that I would strongly oppose. Do I think $100,000 is correct? Absolutely, I do not. Um, but certainly there must be accountability around how this funding is paid, how it is spent and how it is publicly accounted for. So I'm asking all councillors to support an additional referral, um, which is to ensure that there is a system of public reporting and acquittal for any expenses of office allowances by all of the committee chairs, Lord Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, Opposition Leader and the Chair of Council. Um, Brisbane ratepayers expect um, that ratepayers' funds will be used wisely, can be accounted for and can be publicly justified, and that is not possible under the current regime. So I urge all councillors to support the motion point, amendment before Point of us. order. Uh, will Councillor Johnson just take a question? And this is a legitimate question. Um, What's that, Councillor Johnson, will you take a question? Yeah, so uh, in relation yeah. to this proposal, um, uh, on the first line, a special meeting includes a system of public review. Um, if you're willing to change this to considers a system of public review, um, we will accept the motion. Uh, this is directing the tribunal to do something where 
alternatively ask them to consider. If you're happy to ask them to consider, then it's something we're happy to support. Well, I just draw your attention, Lord Mayor, to the, amend to the motion that you're putting forward, which is not asking them to consider. I've, I've used the language in the motion that's been put forward. The, yeah, and so am I. The review and special meeting includes a public system of, so review and approved terms of references. I don't think that this is in any way materially different. Um, and it is my view that we should be asking the tribunal to develop a system not to consider a system, but to develop one. Um, because in my view, the tribunal has already indicated, uh, and so thank you for the question, but in my view, the tribunal has already indicated in its last report, um, and that is the report of the 2017 committee, they state very clearly that they believe it should be paid as cash. Now, in my view, um, the three uh, members of this tribunal are out of step with public thinking about this. So I would be very concerned that without some direction, and I'm not specifying what the system should be, I'm simply saying they should put in place a system, um, I am concerned that they may not agree to the change. Because they state very seriously, and I refer to page one of their report, the executive summary, the tribunal indicated that it considered there was merit in removing allowances altogether and rolling them into the salary of office holders. So, you know, do I, do I think the Lord Mayor should have a $100,000 pay rise? No. Do I think the Lord Mayor should be getting $100,000 of walking around money without accountability? No. Do I think um, that there should be a public system of, uh, uh, sorry, a system of public reporting and acquittal for the use of these expenses? Yes, I do. Do I believe that we should task the tribunal with undertaking a review which includes developing this system? That is absolutely what I am putting forward for uh, approval before council today. Further speakers to uh, Councillor Johnston's new amendment, Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And based on the response to the Lord Mayor's question, we won't be supporting this amendment. We were in good faith asking Councillor um, Johnson to change the includes to considers because we are very adamant on this side of the chamber, as the Lord Mayor has said, that we will not be determining the outcome of the tribunal. It is an independent tribunal that is to do a review and to consider all the things before them. We are happy to put in the terms of reference for them to consider the amendments put forward by Councillor Johnson, but we will not be directing them to do anything at all. This is binding the remuneration tribunal by including a report. We ask them to consider it, but we're not making it compulsory. We are going to accept the umpire's decision. We are not directing on this, but unfortunately, because of the, without the change of the word from includes to consider, we cannot support this amendment. Thanks, Chair. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I, um, I, I speak in support of the amendment, uh, and I disagree with uh, the Deputy Mayor's assessment that we're not um, setting um, the terms of reference for the remuneration tribunal in suggesting what they can and can't look at, because we quite clearly are um, setting that. So in, in here um, uh, and uh, in the direction we give to the remuneration tribunal, we certainly can, as a council, say to them, this, uh, here are the terms of reference and here um, is what you should be looking at. And one of those things is developing um, a system of public reporting and acquittal for any expensive office allowance, uh, whatever that level of that allowance is. Is $20,000 uh, for the Leader of the Opposition and Chairs appropriate for those expenses of office? Uh, is $100,000 appropriate uh, for a proper expense uh, of office allowance for the Lord Mayor? Um, no one in the administration um, has offered any evidence to suggest uh, that those levels um, are appropriate, uh, how they were um, arrived at. Um, this is obviously a system that was brought in 20-plus um, years ago. 
Uh, and we're at a we're in we're in 2019 right now, and we know that communities the community's expectations about how ratepayers' money is being used um, uh, is that it should be fully and utterly accountable. So why can't we have a system where if the Lord Mayor or a councillor is paid uh, or allocated twenty thousand or a hundred thousand dollars that that isn't accountable? So the Lord Mayor wouldn't answer. Uh, either to the media uh, last weekend uh, or today in question time on record what, those, um, what that money is being used for. Uh, all he could say is the same. Point of order. Point of order to you, Lord Mayor. Will Councillor Cassidy take a question? Councillor Cassidy, will you take a question? No. No. <laughs> I know what the question would be, what do I spend mine on? I've only, I've only received... That wasn't the question. Uh, um, I'll answer on. that one anyway. <laughs> all right. Well... No, I'm not taking a question. Okay. Right, please carry on. Um, so the Lord Mayor, it was put very clear to the Lord Mayor, and today he said he spends his money, he spends his $100,000 broken down into 52 weekly payments on exactly the same thing that every Lord Mayor before him has spent theirs on. So has he checked with Graham Quirk and Campbell Newman uh, and Tim Quinn uh, and Jim Sawley? Did he pick up the phone and did they compare bank statements and tax returns? I mean, the Lord Mayor... I'm sure he didn't lie. I'm sure he didn't mean to, if he did. Um, but he has no idea. If these are cash payments going into a bank account, which they are, week on week, he has no idea what previous Lord Mayors were spending their money on. And that is the point, Lord Mayor, that you don't know what previous Lord Mayors are spending their cash on. You don't know what any of these chairs are spending their cash on. Not their cash, ratepayers' cash. And therefore, if you follow that logic, no ratepayer knows what that cash is being spent on, because you do not tell them. There is no accountability whatsoever when it comes to this system. If there are legitimate expenses as being a chair, now we have legitimate expenses as being um, councillors, whether that is supporting community groups, whether that is sponsoring local events, putting on morning teas for seniors groups, buying wreaths for Anzac Day and Remembrance Day, all those sort of expenses of our office are fully accounted for, and Councillor Johnston went through uh, the extra level of accountability we now have in terms of our, our local procurement in ward offices. If there are legitimate expenses that these LNP chairs are incurring as part of their duties of being the chair of the Environment Committee or being the chair of the Public and Active Transport Committee uh, or being the chair of council, then they should be laid out very clearly to the ratepayers of Brisbane. Uh, and I think the only way to do that is for the tribunal to have a root and branch review of what is a reasonable expense of office, what is a reasonable amount to be allocated to that, and a system where ratepayers know exactly, exactly how much is being spent on what. I don't think that's unreasonable. I think the people of Brisbane um, deserve that when it comes to um, in excess, in excess of one million dollars a year, a, a term being spent uh, in cash payments to politicians, and that's why I'm supporting uh, this amendment. Uh, as I flagged, we were willing to support this uh, amendment with a very minor reasonable change. Unfortunately, uh, that change wasn't granted, uh, and I'll tell you why it was a reasonable change. Because there has been plenty of precedent in the past whereby independent tribunals and other authorities have looked at various types of allowances and they've determined that the cost of administering and acquitting those allowances exceeds the value of the allowance itself. And I'm not making this stuff up. Have a look. So in order, in order for someone to acquit, in order for someone to acquit uh, every single dollar out of an allowance, and I'm not talking about one particular allowance, I'm talking about any allowance, uh, will no doubt require extra staff, extra costs in council, and it is quite likely that that cost will exceed the value of the allowance. Um, so uh, this is why we're saying consider, consider pros and cons. We're not saying do something, we're not saying don't do something, we're saying consider. That was our proposal. But I would simply ask this question. Councillor Cassidy um, uh, making a quite clearly political point in his speech just now. Has he asked Councillor Cumming 
what he spent his allowance on for the last three and a half years. Because I can tell you, over the last three and a half years, I calculate that Councillor Cumming would have received around $70,000 in allowances. I would like to see him quit every single dollar of it under Labor's policy. I'd like to know what he spent that money on. Because in the end, I've been the Lord Mayor for around six months. Councillor Cumming has pocketed more money uh, than any allowance that I've been paid. Councillor Cumming uh, has pocketed more money than I have ever received as Lord Mayor when it comes to that allowance. And Labor and their hypocrisy is being exposed right now because their rule is, oh, the LNP should acquit, but we shouldn't have to. And, and Councillor Cassidy, who has been uh, the leader of the opposition for point five order, minutes. Um, he's, he's willing point to... Point of order. Point of order. Yeah, I've acknowledged you. Um, claim to be misrepresented. It's been noted. Uh, Lord Mayor. Councillor Cassidy is so uh, generously willing to acquit the, the five dollars that he might have been paid in allowances since he's become opposition leader, yet he hasn't asked Councillor Cumming what those allowances were spent on for the last three and a half years. Uh, so this is pure politics. It is pure hypocrisy. Uh, the reality is simple. This allowance has existed long before uh, Councillor Cassidy got here, long before I got here, and in fact is, has existed for the Lord Mayor since the very first Lord Mayor of Brisbane, William Jolly. And so uh, Labor is speaking with forked tongue here. Uh, they have absolute double standards. Uh, they see a cheap opportunity to try and score political points uh, and they uh, are going for it simply because they do not have anything else. They do not have any ideas. They do not have any policies. They do not have any vision. They do not have any plans for the city. Uh, and all they have is an opportunity for personal attacks, an opportunity to throw mud in the hope that some sticks, and, and suddenly a strenuous objection to something that they have not had a concern about until a matter of days ago. Until a matter of days ago. Uh, so I'd simply say, Councillor Cumming, tell Councillor Cassidy what you've spent every dollar of that allowance on for the last three and a half years, uh, and, and then we will give you some credibility. Uh, but until you're willing to do that, uh, then really, uh, we should not really believe that your concern is genuine. So unfortunately, we can't support this proposed am amendment uh, because Councillor Johnson is not willing to make a sensible and reasonable change. Uh, as I said, it is reasonable to ask the tribunal to consider this, but they also have to consider the cost of any changes as well, uh, because any changes potentially would come with costs. Uh, and as I said, there's plenty of precedent not just at council, but at other levels of government, where the cost of acquitting uh, each expense far outweighs the allowance being paid. Uh, and that's not a sensible use of ratepayers' money. And now, Councillor Cassidy earlier on today asked, oh, have there been any private holidays with the allowance? Uh, oh, has he asked the same question of Councillor Cumming? Has Councillor Cumming gone any, on any private holidays? And I would simply say this, Councillor Cassidy, you've been getting paid as a councillor since 2016, I think, is it? Yeah. Um, your salary is paid for by ratepayers. Are you going to account for every single dollar of salary that you've been paid? Are you going to tell every ratepayer what you've spent every single dollar of salary on? No one would expect you to do that. Uh, but that is essentially uh, where Labor's going with this, uh, and ultimately uh, they are not prepared to do it themselves with Councillor Cumming, uh, and unfortunately, I can say that we are not prepared to uh, support this motion. Uh, Councillor Cassidy had a misrepresentation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Sergeant Schultz, I mean the Lord Mayor over there, uh, just said that um, I wanted a system that only affected LNP councils. That is uh, absolute rubbish. This amendment is very clear that it should, of course, include uh, going forward the um, Leader of the Opposition as well, whoever, whoever that may be in this place at any particular time, it should cover thank all, you. Thank you. It should yep. cover yep. all, all right. councillors. Yep. All right. Further debate to the amendment. 
There being no councillors rising to their feet, Councillor Johnston, do you wish to respond? Yes, thank you. Uh, and I thank those people who contributed to the debate. Um, however, Lord Mayor, I've got a few minutes to speak now and I'm going to put on the record a few issues of concern and I urge you to reconsider your position. Firstly, the motion before us today that I am um, attempting to amend by adding this clause does not ask the Remuneration Tribunal to consider a review of superannuation. It directs them, in the terms of reference, to undertake a review that includes superannuation. Interestingly, you've padded it out with a number of other things, um, which looks to me like you're sending them a subtle message of offsetting against uh, salary increases. By Point of order. That. Point of order to you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Johnston is imputing motive. I think that um, that uh, this is a sensitive topic, and I, I think I like that largely. Um, People have been pretty respectful. Uh, I think, uh, Councillor Johnston, I think that um, it would be in everyone's best interests if you just stuck to the uh, matter at hand, please, Councillor Johnston. And I'm referring to the yellow highlighted sections in the terms of reference we were given today, um, which includes, let me be clear, the purpose of this document is to clearly define the terms of reference for the 2019 Independent Councillor Remuneration Tribunal. It specifically adds council contributed superannuation. It doesn't say and consider whether you'll look at council superannuation. It directs the tribunal to consider it. Now the Lord Mayor wants to make a distinction and say my amendment doesn't say consider. He's trying to say that my and the Deputy Mayor tried it as well. He's trying to say that my amendment says that they must undertake a course of action. That course of action is to include a system of public reporting and acquittal for any expense of office allowances. How they do it is completely a matter for them. In exactly the same way as they are being asked, uh, no, no, not asked, they're being told that they must consider under the Lord Mayor's emotion, uh, motion, council contributed superannuation. There is absolutely no difference between the motion that I've put forward um, and the Lord Mayor's motion. They do exactly the same thing. They leave how this will be done to the tribunal. They make no uh, reference to the way in which it should be carried out. Um, and it is appalling that the Lord Mayor is seeking to make a distinction that is not apparent in his own motion before us today. Let me be clear. We are being asked to approve the terms of reference. The terms of reference clearly direct the remuneration tribunal to undertake a review of superannuation. The amendment before us today simply asks them to look at establishing a public reporting and acquittal system for any expense of office allowance. How they do it is a matter for them. This Lord Mayor is playing semantics and meanwhile the upshot of what he's about to do is to ensure that he will continue to receive $100,000 in cash on a order, basis Mr. Chair. with no questions yep. asked. Yes, Deputy Mayor. This is very clearly about a review going to tribunal independent. The Lord Mayor is not asking anyone. She is imputing motive again. Um, Councillor Johnston, can you just please um, focus your attention on the debate we've just had and the amendment that you proposed, please. It's a matter of fact that the Lord Mayor is being paid $100,000 in cash on a weekly basis and does not have to account for it. Why is the Deputy Mayor trying to hide it? She gets just over $20,000 in cash in her bank account on a weekly basis and doesn't have to account for it. And let me be clear, the motion before us today simply says the following that the review and special meeting includes a system of public reporting and acquittal for any expense of office allowances. That's it. How hard is it for the Lord Mayor to produce a receipt, to send it in to councillor support and to get reimbursed? Now that would be the simple way to do it. We already do this. There's 26 councillors in here and they do it every day for us. Now that's just my view on how it should be done. I'm not directing the tribunal on how to do it. And the upshot of this, and I'll say it again, if the Lord Mayor votes against it, the upshot is he will continue to receive $100,000 in cash in a weekly instalment in his bank account, and he does not have to account for it in any way, shape or form. That is wrong. 
I became aware of that last week and I am making a genuine effort as a councillor to ensure that there is a system of public reporting and accountability for the expenditure of this allowance. I haven't suggested it be cut. I haven't suggested he shouldn't get one. I'm simply saying that it's public funds, it's ratepayers' funds, and he should be able to account for it, as should every other chairman in this place. Voting against this, Lord Mayor, is a mistake through you, Mr Chairman. I urge you to reconsider in the next few minutes. The simple thing here is to um, refer this motion to the tribunal and allow them to consider it as part of their review. That is the way to do it. Whatever decision they make, they make. I can't influence that and neither can you. But it would right, be Councilor wrong Johnston, your to time stop has expired. this. Okay. Now, to the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment that is before us say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division, Division called by Councillor Johnson and Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being seven in favour and 17 against. The noes have it, please return to your seats. Further speakers to the amended motion. Anyone? Anyone? Is, is Councillor Shree, you responding to speak? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on the amended motion, um, and my message is quite simple tonight. Give us all a massive pay cut. I think um, what's been frustrating about this whole debate is that it's been dancing around the, the core issue here, which is that all the councillors in this place, including the Lord Mayor, are paid far too much. We are all disgustingly overpaid and we need a massive pay cut of tens of thousands of dollars. What, what the Mayor and, and the Administration are doing here is trying to respond to public frustration that um, councillors are overpaid by making small tokenistic changes. Now, I, I support these minor changes because they, they're slightly better than the status quo, but it's, it's a simple fact that councillors are still paid far too much the problem with that is that we lose touch with the needs of the vo most vulnerable members of our electorate. All the councillors in this place, I'm sure, work very hard to find out what's important to their residents and to understand their residents' concerns. But when, is it, when a person is paid so much more than the, than the residents they're representing and the, and the vast majority of members of society, they naturally, over time, are going to lose connection with the lived experiences and the material realities of the um, lowest income members of our society. Now the public understands this. That's why there's so much um, public sentiment opposed to the idea of politicians on high salaries. But particularly here in council, I think it's, it's problematic because it results in a situation where some councillors, I'm not saying all councillors, but some councillors put their hand up for these roles because the pay is so good rather than because they are genuinely committed to community service. I'm sure there are many. I'm sure there are many councillors in here who, who who put their hand up because they are genuinely committed to community service, and I'm not saying that's everyone. But there is a serious problem here where um, people consider a role in public office not out of a genuine commitment to public service, but out of a desire for personal gain, and that needs to change. It's it's been really interesting to me to see over the last few years that often when I raise concerns about um, the cost of housing or the cost of public transport, um, 
or even issues relating to state policy such as um, e education and healthcare costs. Some councillors I've talked to have expressed surprise that those issues are, are, are of sig significant importance to a lot of residents. It's as though those councillors don't understand what it's like to be poor. They don't understand what it's like to struggle to make ends meet. Now, I know there are some councillors in, in this place who do have those lived experiences, and that's important. But unfortunately, not, that's not the case for everyone. And what's particularly frustrating to me is that, sure, the councillors in this place might work hard, um, but so do a lot of our other council employees. So do our bus drivers, so do our cleaners. They work really hard as well. And they're not paid anywhere near as well as we are as councillors. And so I guess, like, are, are we saying that we're better than those other workers? No, we're not. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't understand why it's such a crazy proposition to say, suggest that politicians should be paid less. Imagine what we could spend that money on if we all took a pay cut. Imagine if, so let's say, let's say the, the Lord Mayor's salary and the, the Chair's salaries were all reduced to 100,000 a year. That's still a heck of a lot more than the average wage. That's still a lot more money than a lot of people in this city earn. Let's say, let's say the chair and the Lord Mayor's salaries were reduced to 100, 100K a year and the rest of the councillor's salaries were reduced to 90K a year. That's still a pretty high income. That's $90,000. I'm not going to sneeze at that. That's a lot of money. That's a, heck of, that's a very big salary in my view. If we, if we cut the mayor and the chair's salaries to 100K a year and cut the councillor's salaries to 90K a year, rough maths, that would save about $2.1 million a year. $2.1 million a year that we could put towards building domestic violence shelters or that we could put towards affordable housing for people on low income. Or we, could, we could do a lot with that kind of money. I think that would be a better use of money. I think spending that $2.1 million a year on domestic violence shelters for vulnerable women would be a much better use of money than simply um, lining our pockets as councillors. I've, um, I've found it frustrating in, in, in my time as a councillor that this suggestion that we should take a pay cut is, is dismissed so quickly and, and, and laughed off as though it's a, a populist move that, that isn't serious. But I'm, I'm quite serious about this. And, and I think we really need to grapple with the fact that we are paid way too much. I, I understand that in, in terms of this, that the, there's an independent tribunal that reviews councillors' salaries, but we could make a strong statement, a clear statement, that we support a reduction in pay. That would, con, con, that would carry significant weight both for the tribunal and for the public more generally. It's, it's, it's an easy thing for us to do, to simply pass a motion that says we support a pay cut. We don't have to put, even have to put a figure on it if we don't want to. We could just say we support a significant pay cut. And, and I think that would be a good thing to do. Um, I, I can hear some other councillors in the chamber scoffing. Um, but I, I think this is something we should seriously consider. When I tell people that I'm paid $150,000 a year, um, th they are flabbergasted. And, and they're very surprised when they, when they compare that to what they're on, they, when they compare that to what other council staff are on. Um, I, I really don't understand why this is such, an, such a strange proposition to the people in this chamber. Um, yes, we work hard. Yes, there are a lot of extra expenses when you're attending long meetings and you don't have time to cook your own meals and all that sort of stuff. But taking, taking lower pay would put us in better touch with the live realities of of people on lower incomes. And I think when, when I'm in a chamber that continually refuses to increase um, public funding for public housing, when I'm in a chamber where we have to fight tooth and nail for um, even minor reductions in council fees, where we still even charge fees to place for transfers and holds on library books, um, I, I don't understand. It, 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 it's just really strange and frustrating to me. Um, so I guess, yeah, my message is simple. Let's, let's stop tinkering around the edges. Let's ask for a massive pay cut and see how the tribunal responds to that. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and uh, it's been a very interesting debate so far. Um, I'm glad to hear that uh, Councillor Cassidy 
is uh, prepared to support the amended motion. I, I do believe it's the right way to move forward. I do, however, feel a fair degree of disappointment that uh, Councillor Cassidy has taken the opportunity to use this really for a bit of political grandstanding. Um, the ALP councillors, and in fact virtually every councillor on the other side of the chamber, has sat through um, reviews in 2013, 2017, uh, where the independent tribunal provided reports. Not a whimper in terms of any proposed changes to those uh, reviews. Um, no specific commentary. And so to come out here today and um, grandstand like this just smacks of political grandstanding and I would say rank hypocrisy. At any rate, I'm glad that they are going to support the amended motion. I strongly believe that moving forward with a, um, a review and a reactivating the independent tribunal is the way to go forward. I think the amended terms of reference provide them with the scope to do the review that they need to undertake. Uh, in the context of Councillor Sri's points, you know, we work extremely hard. I, um, he made reference to um, you know, hard-working council workers and in particular he mentioned bus drivers. You know, I think everybody in this chamber works hard and I think these things need to be seen in the context of how many hours we put in as councillors. I don't know how many hours Councillor Sri puts in, but certainly uh, myself and my colleagues put in a lot of time. It takes us away from our families and that is the decision we make when we take on these roles. But I do believe that people need to look at these uh, uh, levels of compensation in the context of the overall hours worked and the commitment to our communities. So um, I am very, very hopeful that the whole chamber gets behind this motion and supports it. I strongly believe it's the best way forward and it will provide us with some clarity from uh, an independent group. Thank you. Further speakers to the amendment. Excuse me, to the amended motion. There being none, I'll now put the amended motion. All those in favour of the amended motion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division. Division called by Division. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Allen. Ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Tenants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Councillors, are there any petitions? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition uh, from 56 very happy residents in Mount Cravat East of the land that we've bought at Naran and Carrara Street that would like the parcel of land called Carter's Rest. Anyone else? Councillor Mr. Cook. Thank you. Um, I have a petition signed by 1,159 of my residents requesting an urgent upgrade of Riding Road and the intersection of Riding Road and Passion Street. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a petition uh, from residents regarding the long-term preservation of 818 Roadie Road bushland. Councillor Atwood. I have a petition requesting a left turn on a red light at the intersection of Stanton Road and Wynnum Road in Tingalpa. Councillor McLaughlin. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a petition regarding traffic speed in Queen's Road, Hamilton. Councillor Johnston. Yes, I have a petition uh, from residents in Chelma calling on Chelma Street East uh, in Chelma to be reduced to 40 kilometres an hour to improve uh, safety for residents, uh, and pedestrians and cyclists. Councillor Strunk. Oh, sorry. Right. 
That's everybody. All right. Can I please have a resolution? Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. A second. Uh, it's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, general business. Councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a councillor conduct review panel order? No. Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, I rise to speak tonight in regards to the wonderful athletes that we have competing in our city for the INAS Global Games 2019. Uh, Mr Chairman, I had the privilege yesterday afternoon of spending time with some amazing and inspiring people who are the athletes who have come from 47 different countries and to see the level of sportsmanship that was exhibited, not only for their own teammates, but also across the board for all of the athletes, particularly the swimmers, it was wonderful to see. They were all celebrating each other's ability, that ability to compete. There were some major, major um, acts of competitiveness and particularly when some races got down to the wire. And I'm talking about swimming races that got down to five one hundredths of a second last night. It was that close. And the entire stadium at Chandler, the roar that you could hear from the supporters, from the teams, you know, calling out, cheering those swimmers on was absolutely <coughs> wonderful for those swimmers in the pool. Because they were there as swimmers, as competitors, as elite athletes in their field. And that's what the INAS Global Games is all about, celebrating them, including them in the world of sport, which they all truly love. And one thing that was really interesting last night was we had the, um, the Australian 4x100 um, men's relay team and Daniel Fox was able to present the medals to them and he was so excited when he was watching those guys in the pool cheering them on and when they got over the line first with their gold they were so ecstatic and I said to Daniel I said you're going to be so happy presenting that medal to them and he said yes because they're all them they're all my mates and I'm so proud of them and that is what the games are all about and it was wonderful to see how the athletes all responded when they were welcomed into City Hall on the weekend and to have them in that one area where we could see how excited they were as a group together. They shared the excitement, they shared the enthusiasm and they shared their love of sport. And that was absolutely undeniable. And I really, really would like to thank all of the people behind the scenes who have made the INIS Global Games a success not just because it's held here in Brisbane, but most importantly, because of what it means for all of those competitors, for how they are being supported to achieve their goals, their potential, and celebrate their abilities. There are so many people that have worked behind the scenes, and to take a group of athletes away for the Global Games is not just something you can just say, oh, we just need one coach to take a group of 20. It doesn't happen like that. When you understand some of their um, individual requirements for travelling, you have to have many people on board. And those people, whether they're volunteers, whether they're supporters, whether they're coaches, managers, coordinators, carers, family members, friends, 
other teammates, supporters, volunteers, um, people working with INAS, people working here at Council who have been working extremely hard to make this a success. It is everybody combined as a team that have made the Games a success for the competitors. And can I say to the Lord Mayor, um, Laurie is now officially a limited edition. Laurie is actually completely sold out. And so the only lorries that will ever be floating around from last night onwards are the ones awarded during the medal presentation. So as a mascot, lorry has been extremely well received. And we all know that the lorikeet is a very familiar sight around our city of Brisbane. But I would like to say that it was conveyed to me last night about a lovely young athlete from the Faroe Islands and because she was the only competitor in her race she had qualified um, so as the only competitor it didn't um, permit for a medal to be awarded and I think she she was missing the fact that she would have received a lorry more so than she was um, focused on the medal but one of our young male Australian swimmers who had won a couple of medals at that point, gave her one of his lorries in a true act of sportsmanship. And I think that tells a really big story about how they care for each other, they respect each other for their skills and abilities, they respect it from a, a, a position of sportsmanship and inclusion. And to each and every one of the athletes that are here currently in our city and that will remain here for a few more days to come and hopefully a bit longer, I truly hope that you have enjoyed your time in Brisbane. I thank you for inspiring so many people. And to everybody behind the scenes, thank you for supporting our um, participants in the Games because your efforts have truly made a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. On further business, Councillor Shreve. Thanks, Mr Chair. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. I rise to speak about library fees and about the development application for 108 Lambert Street. Um, just on library fees, I'm raising this because a few residents asked me to look into it, um, and I particularly want to draw it to the attention of Councillor Maddock, but also to the Lord Mayor. Um, Currently, when you place a hold on a library book or you ask for a book to be transferred from one library to another, you're charged a fee of 80 cents per book. Um, I understand that that's actually a legacy from a time when council used to notify residents um, via mail. So the, the book would be, pla it'd be placed on hold and they'd send you out a letter once the book was available or the book would be, the transfer would go through and they would send you a, send you a letter by post once the um, book had made it to the library where you were going to pick it up. So through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Matic, that fee only existed, that 80 cent fee existed because it represented the cost of sending out a printed letter to the resident who placed the hold or requested the transfer. Um, today that's no, no longer done. We just send out emails to residents who um, place holds and request transfers. So there's Actually, the fee that we're charging residents doesn't actually represent the cost of the hold or transfer. So there's no strong reason, in my view, for that fee to continue to exist. And as a matter of equity, it would seem to me logical that we scrap that fee. We're only talking about 80 cents per book anyway, so the cost of council is not significant. But it is a major deterrent to residents, and it's a disincentive for those residents who use smaller libraries. So, for example, in my ward, um, we have the West End Library. It's a very small library. It doesn't have a wide range of books. Um, and if residents go there and request a book, they're told, oh, yeah, you can request a book from another bigger library, but you have to pay an 80 cent fee per book. That fee really adds up, particularly for people on lower incomes. And if we're committed to the principle that libraries are about ensuring equitable access to, to resources and books, then surely we should be scrapping that fee because the practical effect of that fee for users of smaller libraries is that you have to pay 80 cents to borrow a book. That's how it works out in practice for people who live close to those smaller libraries and don't have the mobility or the, or the capacity to access the larger regional libraries. So it's a very simple request. It should be a very, relatively small change to make. So Councillor Matic, 
Lord Mayor, please don't, don't delay on this one. It, it should be a simple good news story for you. Um, it's an old fee that, that should have been scrapped a long time ago. Turning to um, the DA for 108 Lambert Street, Kangaroo Point, I noted the Lord Mayor's response to my question in question time, and I just want to emphasise that there's a clear problem here with the mechanism where, Lord Mayor, you've previously written to me and said that as each development application uh, development is undertaken, the river walk would be com completed. Now what's being proposed as part of this DA is not that the river walk will be completed, but that the council, that the land will be um, designated that the developer can't build on it, creating an opportunity for council to buy the land down the track. The problem with this approach is that it becomes significantly more expensive to build riverside footpaths once those big new developments have been built on that, that site. I took your point earlier about um, the fact that sometimes leaving construction up to private developers and private body corporates um, doesn't re result in the best outcomes, and I agree with that. But my point is that any construction work of building riverside footpaths is going to be significantly cheaper and less disruptive if it occurs before the big towers are built. Otherwise, that construction work is going to have to occur from the riverside. We're not talking here about floating walkways or big, big boardwalks that stretch out over the river. We're talking about building concrete footpaths and railings on the actual river bank. And so it's essential that each development application, at the time it, that, that building, those buildings are constructed, that the footpaths along the river are completed at the same time. My view remains that Council should simply be acquiring all the land it needs along there and doing all the footpaths in one hit. There are only a few sections remaining, and that would be the, the cheapest and, and quickest and most effective way to do things. But if Council is adamant that it does not want to do the river walk all in one go, at the very least you should be requiring that as this DA for 108 Lambert Street is assessed, that you not only acquire the land, but also complete the footpath at the same time. Thanks. Further business? Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I rise to speak about the great investment our Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner is making to support and grow local small businesses across our great city. We heard three new initiatives announced earlier today from Councillor Adams, which will see the Brisbane become the most friendly small business city in Australia. My support comes from my experience before coming into Council as a small business owner myself and growing up in a small business household. The Doughboy Ward is home to hundreds of small businesses in services, retail and manufacturing. Naturally, a great number of these small businesses are family concerns, and in talking to just a couple of them earlier today in Carina, they are very excited to see the uh, Schrinner administration adding further to support to the lifeblood of local communities. Yes, adding. In addition to the two million cuts in fees and charges announced in the 2019-20 budget earlier this year. Now, a very exciting project starting next week in my ward of Doughboy is the Village Precinct Project Upgrade to Kenrow Street in Carina. I have loved getting out and about and speaking with residents and businesses about this exciting upgrade, as it is a much-loved shopping precinct. In fact, 119 residents and local businesses completed the online survey to have their say. Upgrades under the Village Precinct Project will include footpath upgrades to improve accessibility, maintenance and visual amenities, pedestrian crossing upgrades, build-outs into the road carriageway with tree planting and enhancing the visual and physical amenity, shade, traffic calming and pedestrian safety, new and improved green beds with ground cover plantings and street furniture. I again recognise and thank the locals of Carina for getting involved in this project through their quality feedback. It is just another real investment being made by the Schrinner-led administration. I also thank the council officers who have assisted in the planning, and I thank the construction team who will be doing the hard, sweaty, dirty work between now and Christmas. For the Carina locals, businesses in Kenrow Street will continue to trade during the construction period, so please continue to support them. Construction will primarily take place between 7 p.m. and 5 a.m. Sunday to Thursday with an aim to keep disruption um, at a minimum. I look forward to joining my fellow residents of Doughboy Ward to celebrate the completed re revitalisation project in January. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Atwood. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Deputy Chair. I rise to tonight to talk about a wonderful event that occurred in my ward uh, in early September. 
This is something I would have spoken about uh, before we went on recess, if we were given the opportunity, uh, the Sandgate Youth Festival. Uh, the inaugural Sandgate Youth Festival uh, went off with a bang on Saturday 7th of September, showcasing local talent, local businesses and our local community what was a fantastic display of community support for local young and emerging artists. Uh, I was proud to establish the Sandgate Youth Festival alongside a local small business, Beat Connection DJ and Live Music, to provide an avenue for young up-and-coming musicians to get traction within the music business. With acts uh, preceding the competition, uh, the second half of the evening focused on eight musical acts that were hand-picked from performances at our annual Iron Bumpin' Festival held in Sandgate. These eight acts fought it out uh, in a competition for a prize of $500, a contract for one year of access or streaming platforms through Gyrostream and industry mentoring. Uh, in the end, the band 1012, a band, up, a band made up of four Aspley High students and former students, uh, took out the prize to make their mark as the first act to win in the Sandgate Youth Festival. I'm very excited that we've established this brand new festival that will no doubt help launch the careers uh, of some amazing new Brisbane bands. Uh, the event was not only a great success for the acts themselves performing, but also a win for the community. There were hundreds of people who attended the event, uh, maintaining their enthusiasm for the performances on display throughout the entire evening. I'd like to thank the Sandgate and broader community for supporting this great new event uh, and supporting, uh, most importantly, young musicians. The event would not have been a success uh, without the local community support. I also want to thank the local businesses that gave up their um, uh, Saturday evening to come and hold stalls at this event and provide food and entertainment options uh, for attendees. Uh, and, and finally, just like to thank our sponsors for the event. Uh, a huge thanks to Coon Corp Press uh, Print and Packaging, uh, Sterling Hinchliffe, the State Member for Sangat, Annika Wells, Federal Member for Lilly, Gyro Stream, uh, and Dana Freer Designs, as well as um, Beat Connection DJ and live music, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, community events like this don't just happen, and as I mentioned, it takes community local business as well as these sponsors, and of course a, an army of volunteers, uh, most of which were from uh, Ashley High. I'll give them a special shout out. Uh, we are, of course, elected here to represent our constituents in this place and also ensure that communities grow and prosper and are inclusive and supportive to those within. And the Sangat Youth Festival has done this for uh, my local community, uh, especially uh, our, our um, young people in the Deegan Ward, and very pleased to say this festival will now become an annual event. Thank you, Councillor Cassie. Further mm. business? Lord Mayor. I just briefly I want to table this um, as requested. Um, Certainly. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further business? Councillor Cunningham. Deputy Chair, I rise to speak regarding a community tree planting day that I was pleased to host at Greenslopes on Sunday. As a resident of Greenslopes, I was especially happy to take part in the event which brought together our neighbourhood and saw over 160 trees added to the streets surrounding Thompson Estate Reserve. Thank you to over 100 volunteers who gave up their time and energy to help make our suburb a better place. In addition to tree planting, there was a native animal display, live music, food trucks, games and a sausage sizzle from the Wishart Chester Scout Group. I want to give my thanks to Stephanie from, and the team from Norman Creek Catchment Committee, who are also there on Sunday, to talk to our community about getting involved to help look after our local waterways. All the new street trees were carefully chosen to suit the local area, and as a thank you for participating, residents also got to take home their own free native plants. Trees planted included lily pillies, pink flowering bottle brush, tuckaroo, ivory curl, the Australian tulip wood, and others. They add to approximately half a million street trees already across Brisbane. Now, while I don't need to explain the value and the virtue of continuing to add trees to our urban forest, by partnering with the community to plant them, I'm hoping that residents will develop friendships with these new leaky, leafy locals. This will lead to ownership of our street tree scape. Over the next year, the trees will be visited 30 times for watering by council to ensure these green investments become well established. But with this extended dry weather, Deputy Chair, if you have a street tree near your home, whether it be new or old, I would encourage you to take a bucket into the shower, 
Capture some extra drops that would otherwise go down, to the, go down the drain and pour that on your local street tree. I'd like to acknowledge the work by the dedicated council officers in helping make the day possible. I thank the Lord Mayor for attending, as well as Councillor Hammond and Councillor Howard for this practical initiative, which is making the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today. Thank you, Councillor Cunningham. Is there any further business? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. I rise to speak on two matters, one about a man named David and one about a man named Jack. The first one is Canon David Garland. Some people in this room may know that name, but many Australians don't seem to know who he is. Canon David Garland was essentially the architect of Anzac Day. Believe it or not, one of the very first Anzac Days ever held anywhere in the world was here in Brisbane. In fact, some people say Brisbane was the home of Anzac Day. Now, Canon Garland came from Ireland to Australia as David Garland before he fell into a crowd of ministers and decided he should become a minister as well. And then at the outbreak of World War I, he went over to the Middle East with the Australian troops and uh, pastored to Australian troops in the Middle East. And he saw the devastation of war and when he came back, he decided we should honour these troops. So before the war had even finished, Canon David Garland had established Anzac Day. And obviously the date chose itself due to the Gallipoli invasion. But it was Canon David Garland who decided we should have the ode and we should have the one minute of silence. And all of this started in Brisbane. And Canon David Garland was especially well known in the Greek community because he, uh, he did quite a lot of work in Greece and he was presented with what was called the pectoral cross. The pectoral cross is a cross that priests and so on wear around their chest. And in this pectoral cross was what is said to be a sliver of Jesus's cross. So it doesn't matter if you're not a religious type, that is a pretty amazing piece of history. So he came back to Australia and the local Greek community in Brisbane decided this pectoral cross that you were given does not meet the standards that you are owed. So they did a collection and they got some Queensland gold and some Queensland rubies from Ruby Vale up in uh, North Queensland and they adorned this beautiful pectoral cross. And this has been in the Garland family for generations since. And last week... Canon Garland's great nephew and his daughter visited Brisbane from England and they brought out the pectoral cross and showed it to me in Anzac Park at Tawong. And I tell you, Chair, it is incredible. I had to put on the white gloves and there it was, a sl sliver of what is said to be Jesus' cross, 2,000 years old. That's pretty amazing. Now, in Anzac Park last week, we had a tree planting ceremony to honour Canon Garland. And the next day, we had another event at Anzac Park. People may know there is an overpass for pedestrians and cyclists from Anzac Park over to the Tawong Cemetery. That is now known as the Canon Garland Overpass. And apparently, it's quite a big deal to have a piece of road infrastructure named after a human being. So, uh, you know, we take that and we say, well done, Canon Garland. And his death was 80 years ago on the day that we commemorated him in the park. Mm -hmm. And he is buried in Tawong Cemetery. This is an amazing link, a, his a link to history in our local area. And I want to pay particular tribute to a man named Peter Collins, who leads the Canon Garland Memorial Group. Without Peter Collins' input, none of this would have been possible. The memory of Canon Garland would start to dissolve away as uh, just a distant memory. So well done, Peter, and well done the other people in the memorial group for bringing this to the attention of not just Brisbane residents, not just Queenslanders, but Australians. Hopefully, we get to see the pectoral cross donated to the Museum of Brisbane, which is the wish of the great nephew of Canon Garland. I, for one, would desperately like to see that happen. 
The second item I'd like to talk about is a man named Jack. Jack Ireland is 20 years old and lives just around the corner from me in St Lucia. Now Jack is competing at the Innes Games this week and he has a very full program chair. He's doing, amongst other things, the 400 individual medley and get this, the 200 metre butterfly. Imagine doing 200 metres of butterfly. Well, he does it in record time for himself and he's planning on setting a personal best. So Jack, if you don't come back with a gold, that's okay. If you don't come back with a personal best, that's fine. So long as you do your best, mate, because I know you train 40 hours a week in the St Lucia UQ pool. So well done, mate, and Khan Australia. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Is there any further business? There be no one rising to their feet. I declare the meeting closed. Thank you.